Blessed be everybody. Hello and welcome to episode seven of Black Magic Talk. I am so excited for this episode because today we have my teacher who um, came to me quite by accident. I wasn't really looking for her, but um, I kind of needed a teacher at this time to better my magic. And um, she just kind of popped up on my screen and I'm so glad I got to know her. Um, her name is Sandra. And she's from Australia. Sandra, if you would like to introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for having me on the podcast. Uh, it's really exciting to, to do a podcast with you, seeing I've known you for quite a few years now. <laughs> so it's good fun. And, uh, yes, my, my YouTube channel is Mystery Witch School, and I do a lot of YouTube videos on Mystery Witch School. I also have literally a school online that te where I teach Wicca, witchcraft, magic, and tarot and shadow work right the tarot and the shadow work and of course we always have my co-host who is down there hello matt <laughs> if you want to just say hello to everybody <laughs> good evening glad to have you on <laughs> so um sandra let's start with the basics uh what made you want to get into wicca in the first place and how did you kind of find your path It was kind of weird. Uh, I first discovered Wicca when I was about 14 because my mm -hmm. sister, being five and a half years older than me, used to bring books back and I used to read all the books and she was into uh, all things uh, supernatural and psychic. And so I picked up a book by, I think it was uh, Justine, is it Justine Summers? It was called Witch Witchcraft in the Sixth Sense. I don't know if I got the author's name correct. And I read that book and I, I remember thinking, oh, wow, this is really cool. But then I totally forgot about it and moved on. And it was when I, that was when I was 14. And then when I was around uh, 22, I came, my sister and I went to a house that belonged to a friend of my mother's. And on her veranda, there was a carving of a woman sitting on top of what looked like a, a cauldron. And as soon as I saw that carving, it reminded me of the book and reminded me of Wicca. And all of a sudden I had this urge to find out more about it, to, to go and, 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 yeah, find out more about it, to go and find some books about it. So my sister and I on the same day went to one of the bookshops, the New Age bookshop, and uh, I bought a book by Scott Cunningham, which was uh, The Truth About Witchcraft Today. She bought a book on tarot. And as I was reading that book, I couldn't put that book down. It was like everything in it was like coming home. It was that feeling of, yes, this is this is me. This is this is home. This is my spirituality. And it was like it all happened within, you know, pretty much that one day mm -hmm. of seeing this carving. Um, and was it like, you know, um in when you picked up this book and started to learn more was it um you know kind of like love at first sight or did it take you know a couple of years to kind of get on your path of um an eccentric Wiccan it was immediate it okay. was as soon as I read that book I started practicing I started feeling that connection to nature I started yearning for it I'd always being connected to nature even as a child. I'd loved going to rainforests. I loved going to the beach. I loved going to all these natural places. And I was as I was reading the book and I started to realise that this is about a connection to nature and to the unseen aspects around us, it just felt like, yes, I'm going to do this. I want to do this. And so I was doing it in secret because at the time I was living at home with my mother who was a Catholic. And so mm. I remember doing petition spells in the bedroom and like burning petitions in the bedroom, burning incense and things like that. Uh, it, yeah, it was immediate. Mm. And as you grow, you know, you grew up and you became an adult, was it something still prominent in your life? And um, how did you come out and tell people yes, I'm a witch and I'm going to follow Wicca. Did you find a lot of pushback or was everyone kind of like, oh, that's really interesting? 
fortunately for me, when I was in my 20s, I was very much a part of the alternative scene mm -hmm. and the music scene at, at the time. And so people were pretty open to all that kind of thing. So I never really had a problem with my friends knowing or anyone else knowing. I spent about 18 months as a solitary right at the beginning. I was looking for a coven, but they're very hard to find. Mm -hmm. And when I did find my coven, of course, I found other like-minded people who were a mix of people from different uh, socioeconomic groups, different subcultures. And, you know, once again, it, it, I was around a lot of community that supported what I was doing. The only people who didn't know would have been my family. Uh, apart from my sister, she knew. She used to come to some of the Sabbaths and things. But as far as my mum or my mother's family, they were the ones that sort of weren't in the know. But it was very easy to even keep it a secret from them at the time. <laughs> yeah. And it's been with me throughout my journey. So even though at a certain point I got a little bit... Um, disillusioned with some of it because I felt it wasn't really helping me solve my problems of my my inner self, my inhibitions, my fears, my my doubts, all of that inner stuff, that shadow work stuff. It There wasn't anything at that time that helped me with that. So I did go and look for other, uh, other spiritual traditions to try and fill that gap, such as Buddhism and Sufism. I explored other magical traditions as well from more of an intellectual perspective. And it was, wasn't until much, much later that I came back to the craft fully with all of that stuff and started to get involved with it again, which was interesting because that started to happen around the end of 2010. And I started to get back into the community again in 2012. Okay very significant year for, for change, 2012. Yeah. Now tell me about the coven. You had mentioned it on one of our talks before, but I kind of want to get a sense, like what was the coven to you? How did you uh, fit in, so to speak? And we did have an author named Sonia Smith, who, who is from the UK, a uh, wonderful lady. I, I love her to death. I want to have her back on. Um, and she was kind of saying how like in a coven, uh, once you become priestess, you have to kind of go and make your own coven. I, I honestly have never heard of that, but, um, you know, because it's the UK, they may have different standards for covens. So just kind of explain your coven and um, how far did you get and what did you reach uh, priestess and um, why did you leave that kind of thing so that, uh, you know, our audience kind of sees like, you know, what being solitary, but then also having a coven would be like? So the first coven that I was with, the Solar Orb, they were a training coven. So they had been with their coven for about 20 years and they were like third degree and they hived off because they moved. I think they were living here in Brisbane, whereas the coven was, was further south. Mm -hmm. And, yes, it is traditional in, say, Gardenerian Wicca and I think and also Alexandrian Wicca where once you reach third degree, you then would hive off and form another coven so that they're all small groups and the groups don't get too big. It also, I guess, spreads as well. Uh, but these days I think people are a little bit more relaxed about those kinds of things. But with this particular coven, they decided to make it a training coven because they wanted to teach. And we were the second batch. So they'd been going a year before I joined and my cohort joined. And finding it, I actually found it at a Body Health and Harmony, I think it was called at the time. It's an expo that happens every year in Brisbane. And they had a stall. And they were basically just telling people about what it is that they do and anyone who was interested in coming along and finding out more about uh, Wicca and Witchcraft or wanting to join the coven could come along to a public uh, Sabbath, which I believe was the, it must have been the summer solstice Sabbath because our Sabbaths were public. We allowed other people to come and either participate or they could sit and watch the Sabbath. And so I went along to that and I just absolutely loved it. I think I took... Um, my friend Jan and maybe I think maybe my sister 
and um, another friend along, and I just absolutely loved it and joined, you know, straight away. We started doing, we had like a three-month probation and within that three months we started training in, you know, really basic stuff like working with uh, centering and uh, energy work. And then at the three-month mark, the ones who had gone before us were formed what was called a group of elders. So in a more traditional Gardnerian, Alexandrian coven, you would have the high priest and high priestess, and then you would have uh, a group of elders, and they would be like a council, mm -hmm. and they would vote on whether you would fit in the coven or whether you wouldn't fit in the coven. So I had to sit there and do like an interview with, uh, I think there might have only been five or six at the time. So I got through there and then spent a year in, so that was crafting. And then we had another initiation, which was just called initiation. And when we were initiated, that's when we became a priestess or a priest. And then the next was uh, first degree initiation. And then the next one was second degree initiation and then third degree initiation after that. So they had some extra probably really only one extra initiation apart from the crafting, whereas some other traditions would just have first degree, second degree and third degree. So when I was about to go for my second degree uh, initiation ceremony, uh, probably a month or two before, the coven split and the high priestess hived away from the high priest and formed another coven. And because the solar orb was moving then to Ipswich, which is a fair distance from where I was in Brisbane, and the high priestess was going to form her coven uh, down the road <laughs> from where I was living, <laughs> I ended up going and, and we ended up forming another coven from scratch, and that was called the Lunar Crescent. And so we had, we still worked together, we'd still come together at some Sabbaths and uh, with the solar orb, but we ended up forming our other another coven at that stage and so we decided then that we weren't going to do the degree system we were just going to do initiations and not work necessarily with the masonic uh degree system which is where the degree system sort of comes from it comes from freemasonry and that we'd have more of a shamanic approach whereas the solar orb was more ceremonially oriented and we just differentiated ourselves, I guess, that way. We were more shamanic, earth-based. They were getting more into ceremonial, which is fine. And so that's where I ended up. And then I ended up moving down south after that. And the coven, that coven ended up splitting up because everybody started to move away. Mm. So yeah. can you tell me about the first one? Because you had said like there was initiation, there was a first and then a, a first initiation, second, third. Can you kind of explain like what the initiation, what basically they would do? And also, why did there have to be a second and a third? Can you kind of explain that to for, for well, plenty of reasons? <laughs> if you look at more traditional Wicca, like back in the Gardenary and Alexandrian, uh, Gerald Gardner was influenced by Freemasonry because he, I think he was a co-Mason. Mm -hmm. And so he introduced the degree system into Gardnerian Wicca uh, okay. pretty much after the Masonic degree system. There's two different types of Masonic degrees. I think there's a 32 or 33 degree one, but then there's the three degree one. Okay. And so that's where the degrees actually come from. And... If you read about any of these in a book, they will just talk about first degree, second degree, and third degree. Mm -hmm. With uh, the way that we did it, we had that three months probation. And then after that three months, we had what was called a crafting ceremony. So that was just a welcoming ceremony, basically. And then after that, we had an initiation. And this is something you would read about too, that each time you go for an initiation in the craft, there would be some ordeal that, or something you have to pass in order to be able to get through to the next level. It was called an ordeal in uh, our coven. And it'd be something uh, like you would have to spend a night in the forest by yourself, for example. Mm. That was one ordeal. That's a pretty traditional one. You'd probably read about that. 
I mean, um, heck, you could do that camping. I did that camping. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But with this, you don't have any, you're not supposed to have any comforts. Oh. And I think tradi traditionally when I've read about um, the, the English tradition of doing it, the Gardnerian tradition of doing it, you didn't even have any clothes on your back. You know, you were naked in the forest by yourself. At least we were robed. <laughs> but some of some of us did take some extra things. Like I think some did take a sleeping bag and <laughs> we're really just supposed to have our robe, our, our ceremonial robe and a water bottle and that was all we were supposed to have. And um, anyway, it rained all night. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I can see the sleeping out amongst the stars, but I mean, yeah, I would need the sleeping bag. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, for other other ordeals, there was uh, a test of psychometry. So this is where you're testing your skills in being able to read objects. So we had, uh, uh, I think it was a rune. And a high priest projected a year of his life or memories that he had into the rune. And then we did uh, a meditation and we then had the rune for about five minutes and we would have to then write down whatever came into our mind from holding on to the rune. And I thought, oh, gosh, you know, everybody thought they were going to fail because, I mean, gee, how, how's this going to work? <laughs> I was so surprised. Half, pretty much half the things that I'd written down were spot on with things that he'd experienced in that year that he projected into that room. It was really amazing. And so that was that was one. And another one was having to do an astrology chart. Oh, uh, my favourite. Yeah. Because back then we didn't have computers weren't a thing. Uh, people right. didn't have um, personal computers or anything. They were only just starting to come out. And so we learned astrology, calculating it right from manually calculating it, having the book of the ephemeris, having the book of tables and having to put it all together, draw the chart manually, put in everything manually. And then after hours of doing that, you'd have to then go and try and interpret the whole thing. <laughs> so that's definitely an ordeal. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, though. Um that's why I'm trying to like um, Sonia Smith, who's one of the authors that we had on recently, um, just started a psychic course that I'm now a part of um, because I think uh, now that my magic is getting much, much better due to you. Thank you so much, Sandra, for that. Um, I just want to sort of get to the psychic side and kind of like I can hear spirits, but I want to get to seeing them. Um, and I know Sandra was saying like she could see things with her physical eyes, which is something I want to get to a little later. It, um, I want to know if you've had any kind of like spiritual experiences uh, or if you've seen spirits or any kind of paranormal experiences um, as us witches tend to do. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm kind of curious when um, when they split off and you were with the, the lunar, uh, what was the code? I'm sorry. The lunar, lunar crescent, lunar, mm -hmm. lunar crescent. Right. When you were with them, um, what did, were you uh, still supposed to be initiated or was it kind of like they just kind of made up their own rules on the spot? There was still initiation, but it okay. wasn't in a degree system. So it wasn't following that, um, traditional sort of this is this is your curriculum for this year and a day and then you're tested and um because there was also knowledge tests as well like um exams <laughs> and um <laughs> like being back at school kind of really too. like being back at school a very <laughs> very western approach to spirituality it is <laughs> uh we decided not to do that so much uh we tended to have i guess a bit more of um it was a bit more raw and less hierarchical in that structure okay. because we were predominantly at the time women and so it, it sort of took on more of a feminine way of working rather than the more Gardnerian Alexandrian way of working which is more hierarchical and more masculine in the way that um, that works because it's more well, it's hierarchical which is more masculine mm -hmm. so it changed simply because majority of us were women and uh it just it just morphed that way 
<laughs> uh, no offense, you know. Matt. That's <laughs> just how it went, you know. Um, but I'm sure, were there any men that were actually there? Or was it more just women? At that point. In this, in in the loner present, it it really was mostly females. I think we had two guys okay. in the group, but you yeah. at least still had. Whereas one. <laughs> Solar Orb was more balanced. It was balanced okay. pretty much with males and females. Yeah. Now, do you see um, when it comes to the craft and? you know, your students uh, who can sign up. Uh, I will have all of Sandra's links in the description field, um, her mystery witch school. Um, she is having a, um, it's like half off till Beltane, I think, or maybe it's this whole week. Are you having half off on the, the tarot? I'm having half off on the tarot uh, for the rest of, up until the 30th of April. In okay. US. So, so if Eastern tomorrow. Standard Time, so till tomorrow, mm -hmm. your guys' time and, and mm -hmm. us too, because in Australia it will be 2 p.m. on a Wednesday, the, on the <laughs> 1st of May. But yes, yeah, so you've got another day to get 50% off the Confident Tarot Reader course and also the Shadow Work course, which is the Wheels of Empowerment course. Yes, and I highly recommend those classes. Um, I took her Where to Start Your Witchcraft. Um, I sort of been doing shadow work on my own kind of offline with my soulmate. So, um, but I definitely recommend the tarot. I also took the tarot course, loved it. Um, it was great. And it really explained how, um, you know, you can become your own tarot reader. And, you know, when someone asks you a question, uh, you can read them accurately. Um, so Sandra, tell us a little bit how the mystery school got started how did you come up with that was it you know uh like did it come to you in a dream or it was it something that just kind of popped in your head one day you're like i should be a teacher <laughs> what what made you want to start your mystery witch school and become a teacher which you are wonderful at so <laughs> i don't actually know uh, <laughs> it just happened <laughs> um it was something that i wasn't planning on happening it okay. kind of happened. Um, when I left the Sufi Gurdjieff group, I did feel that I wanted to contribute in some way, um, offering teaching in some way. And it was just after that that I joined a meetup group here in Brisbane. I can't even remember what the name of it was then. I think it was called, um, it later became called Brisbane Craft and Magic, but it had another name. I think it was Brisbane Ipswich Witches or something. <laughs> and uh, sort of got involved in that and in the organisation of that. And then that um, totally changed because um, there's a lot going on between people, as some groups have. <laughs> and so another girl uh, ended up creating a totally different group and she asked me to come and, and lead that group for her So because the other one had died. And um, oh. so... She actually took the initiative and set up a group. And mm -hmm. then, of course, she didn't feel confident teaching. She just wanted to have a group. She wanted to, she wanted to have friends and somewhere to go. So she created the group and then asked me to, <laughs> to lead the teacher. <laughs> so I ended up sort of doing that. And um, it was a bit scary at first because I sort of felt like, okay, I, I knew that it was something I was meant to do. I knew that I was being led to do it because of how it all happened. It was like the universe conspired for it to happen because things just <laughs> went that way. And it was as I was doing that, people would ask me, oh, you know, do you teach? Do you have any courses? You know, were constantly asking me that. And then I ended up getting a redundancy in my corporate job. And at the time, this is when I was really getting into my own shadow work. So I was doing a lot of EFT and tapping and hypnotherapy. I was studying EFT. And I wanted to, my and vision is, was that I was going to do emotional freedom technique or with? tapping. So tapping is where you're using the acupuncture meridian points and you're tapping on them like you would, not like acupressure where you just keep pressure on them, you're tapping on them. What that does is it calms your nervous system down and allows you to connect to your subconscious mind. And it also helps you program, reprogram your thoughts and beliefs because you're starting to communicate with your subconscious mind. And I found that to be an incredible tool to help me with my own shadow work and my own issues with um, all of the inhibitions and everything that I had 
So I thought, you know, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do tapping and I've got to find my niche. So I was going to work with uh, women who were trying to set up uh, businesses in, you know, wellness and more alternative health uh, or psychics or something like that. So I started out doing that. And as I was doing that, I was still working with the meetup group and I started to really feel a pull to go over to working particularly with people who are pagan. I really felt I wanted to work with that niche. I wanted to work with those people because that's where I had come from. And it's not easy to do this kind of work in mainstream circles uh, because our beliefs um, can sound a bit off the planet to some people. And if you're working with people who are trained more mainstream, in wellness or um, mental health and things like that, it, you, it can end up being that your pagan can almost be a symptom of the, to them of, of being not mentally right. Right, <laughs> so a mental illness, I, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so because this was more a personal development thing anyway, it's just been really helpful to work with people who are pagan. So, But I also wanted to teach uh, Wicca and witchcraft using all the knowledge that I acquired from being in different uh, traditions such as Buddhism and the Sufism and Gurdjieff and all of that. And I wanted to bring that into Wicca and Witchcraft because I saw Wicca starting to sort of turn into something that was becoming quite superficial. And also probably more recently a lot of witchcraft and, and paganism's really taken a turn towards more the, the the darker, more base kind of way of being. And I wanted to, I knew that so many people wanted to walk this path to become more conscious and more aware of who they are, what they're doing here, and embracing their divinity through the craft, through magic, but not to, you know, get involved in harming and getting caught up in the, the shadow stuff of resentment and anger and bitterness, but to try and transcend that and create the life they really want to create. So it's sort of, I, I knew I wanted to pivot, but I was a bit scared of pivoting. And so I ended up working with a really wonderful holistic um, business coach and she helped me pivot. She she helped me realise, yes, this seems to be where you want to go. And she helped me uh, set it up so that I could move into it. But it was very scary because I didn't plan on doing it. So you said um, that you would work with uh, shamanic uh, structure from the Buddhism. And I love shamanic beats. Are they just, it's like instant relaxation as soon as I hear it. Um, so, I mean, maybe I should, that's how I should always meditate, <laughs> but, um, so tell us, uh, on the psychic side, um, who you worked with, did you, uh, teach, uh, psychics or did you more like, uh, did you ever help the police, uh, that kind of thing, or maybe the police in Australia? Um, what is the extent of your abilities, um, and would you ever think about teaching maybe psychic abilities to someone like me or someone else who wanted to, you know, make my sight better um, and physically see spirits like with my physical eyes if I could get to that point? <laughs> it's not really an area of focus for me. I do know that the police here in Queensland do work with a psychic um, because friends know who the psychic is that they work for, that, that works for them. So they do work with psychics. Um, and a friend of mine who is a I Ching tarot reader, she's also had detectives come to her as well. Um, but it's not something that I've experienced and I don't focus so much on the psychic stuff apart from for myself. I tend to be the sort of person that, like the spirits can stay where they are and, um, <laughs> you know, I don't really want to get involved in, in conversations with them or get involved with them unless I'm particularly wanting to work um, 
like with a deity or or something like that i'm not really really interested in pursuing that more psychic stuff it's not really my thing my experiences with seeing uh, spirits and entities comes more from when i'm in between sleep and waking is when i seem to be the most visual when it comes to seeing spirits and usually i'm telling them to back off <laughs> oh wait leave I'm me alone let me sleep <laughs> <laughs> um and when i have actually had visual experiences it's usually because i've been in some sort of a trance state and they've just sort of come on instantly my psychic knowing is more clear or clear um cognizant where it comes cognizant. through thoughts i also have that as well feelings yeah mm -hmm. rather than seeing things or yeah so i either feel something or i can sometimes hear like in my imagination hear things or thoughts come through more so than vision yeah see so it's I, not something i would teach at this stage at this stage okay um mm -hmm. maybe in the future do you see yourself maybe, maybe. in the future maybe okay uh, it, as, as I said, it's not really something I've ever really been interested in focusing on particularly. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, I, um, I, I have, I, I'm sort of that way. Yeah. Like I feel answers or like, um, one time I was doing a reading for a friend and I said, why do you pace back and forth? He goes, how did you know that? Nobody knows that I'm doing it by myself. I'm like, I just felt it. Um, sometimes I do see visions. Um, for example, my soulmate and I were talking about something and I had seen a Native American spirit. I couldn't see the face, but I could definitely see that it was a Native American um, spirit that was watching us. Um, now there have there are supposedly Native American spirits around here because um, this was an Indian burial ground at the time and of course you know the white man came and took the land um but this was something completely different something that him and i were were talking about um but like i could see, like i said i could see the body but they wouldn't show their face to me like i couldn't see the face in my in my mind um i can definitely hear spirits in fact i can hear living spirits and i wish i didn't <laughs> I can hear my stupid cousin um, and I wish I didn't hear him, but it's getting like less and less with him. I think Hecate has really worked with us. And, and honestly, uh, Hecate has definitely, uh, when I asked her, will you help me to hear him physically hear, you know, spirits physically? Um, she was right there and she said, you need to get in meditation. You know, you need to, uh, it's like the picking out the hearing. And when I actually will do kind of guided meditations on YouTube and stuff, um, it, it was basically wh exactly what she was telling me are in these guided, you know, YouTube things. So, and I've dreamt about uh, Hecate, that one dream I was telling you about, Sandra, where she came to me and she was kind of like, you know, she laid down on the earth and she's just like, ah, oh, it's been a long time. I haven't been you know, among the humans. And a long time I was like, okay, <laughs> just kind of like, come on, we need to go to school. And I'm like, wait a minute, we're going to the wrong school. <laughs> so it's like, she was kind of like my mother at that point. Only my mother was not so nice. <laughs> my, my physical mother in this um, timeline or this, whatever you want to call it. Some people call it a simulation. Some people call it, um, you know, reality, whatever you want to call this this timeline or reality or simulation, uh, my mom was not so nice. <laughs> and uh, like your mom, Sandra, uh, my mom wasn't Catholic, but she was Methodist. But I had gotten a spell book back when I was, oh, I must have been 11 or 12 years old. And um, I, I just would read it constantly. You know, I would be like, oh, I want to do this. Oh, I want to do that. And I think my mom, when I left her apartment, we were in a second floor apartment. Um, I, when I left, I think she threw it away. I think, yeah, well, actually, well, before we moved. So I moved when I was 16 into this little apartment with my mom. 
And I think she found it and she threw it away. So I tried to keep it from her, but I looked all over that apartment and I could not find my spell book. So, and I've had several others in the, in, you know, in the past, but, um, what would you say? Um, well, okay. I have two questions. So what would you say, uh, is your like favorite spell to do or a spell that you just, you can't get enough of doing? And also my second question is, um, about Hecate, how did she kind of come to you? Did you do a meditation? She just kind of popped in or, I mean, was it kind of like, um, one day she just appeared in your, one of your rituals or whatever? So for the first question, I don't really have a favorite spell. Um, my favorite spell type is candle magic. So mm -hmm. I like to use candles. I like to use the colors and the herbs and, and uh, all that. Uh, the spells that I probably do frequently are, are really just, it's, you know, how you clean your house regularly. Um, I do a lot of um, sort of removing negative energy, so uncrossing spells. I also regularly do curse removals. Um, probably once a month on a new moon I will usually do um, some sort of housekeeping <laughs> uh, <laughs> protection type of spell just to, to keep things, you know, clean and, and clear. So that's probably the most common ones that I do. Um, I've certainly done quite a few money spells over the years because... I just did one too. I, yeah. Um, <laughs> they're probably the ones I've done the most, I think, over the years. have been money spells because I had a lot of... A lot of issues with my relationship with money um Don't we all? so that would probably be the ones that i've done the most i've done love spells too when i was younger um as well but mostly would have been money spells i think with hecate i had never really been interested in working with with hecate mm -hmm. uh i had the greek mythic greek tarot deck and she was the moon card in that mm -hmm. deck it still is the moon Deck. And one day I was sitting out over, looking over the ocean on my sacred uh, rock that I have down, down at the beach and I looked up at the moon and the moon would have been probably maybe four days, three or four days of being full. Okay. And I looked up at the moon and I had this instantly I thought of that card, Hecate, and I sort of heard in, in my Claire cognizant way, it's time to work with me now. A couple of days before that, I think it might have been a couple of days before or maybe a week before, I had got an email from uh, Jason Miller. I was on his email list somehow. <laughs> and um, he was starting to run his um, sorcery, uh, sorcery of Hecate course. And I sort of looked at it and... I, you know, I didn't have, really have an interest in it. I thought, oh, no, I'm not really that interested in that. And then I had this experience with the moon and heard her say, it's time to work with me now. And then three days later, I got another email in my inbox from him about the course and it felt like, yes, I have to do this course. And so I did. <laughs> and um, <laughs> it is like a really good course if you want to work with Hecate in a kind of a Buddhist way, <laughs> he, he because of his Buddhist background, he works with mandalas in the same way that often Buddhists, mm. Buddhists do in similar kind of ways that they work with um, with deity. So he, the way that he sets it up is very much in the astral, so you create an astral temple essentially with okay. uh, the guardians and uh, with other goddesses uh, are a part of that too. And you get to meet other goddesses that are kind of under Hecate's, um, under her supervision, and uh, also other beings that are under her supervision too. And um, it's a it's a really good course. Hmm. Uh, could you send me that? I would be interested in looking at that because um, I love the the Buddhist Om. I like that again. Like the shamanic beats can literally just anywhere I am. I'm just like. Ah, relax. <laughs> yeah, because he uses mantra. He uses okay. the mantra, and um, 
but yeah, it's mantra is very powerful, very good for people who struggle with meditation. I think most of us struggle with meditation, <laughs> but, uh, particularly if you're very active mind. Uh, mm -hmm. It's really good to work with uh, with mantra, and he works with it in in the way that the eastern in the eastern context of working with sound and mantra and vibration and the symbols and um, visualization and um, yeah, it's really good. Mm. Yeah, send that to me and I'll uh, put it down in the description field for anyone else who would like to do it because I'm kind of interested in it now. Um, let me just say real fast, um, I actually um, had always prayed to or called to Aphrodite, who uh, I felt ever since I was a kid, I used to watch, you know, Xena and Hercules. <laughs> and that was actually over in New Zealand, they would actually do that stuff. Uh, they would uh, produce that show and, and record it. So I kind of feel um, close to Australia, but also New Zealand too, because I used to watch Xena and Hercules. And uh, Lucy Lawless was actually from New Zealand. Um, uh, Kevin Sorbo was not. So um, I, uh, yeah, I called to Aphrodite for the longest time. And then I think uh, about the time I started I mean, I was always interested in like Isis. In fact, I had a couple of, I was telling Matt this when we did my statues, uh, we did a statue uh, episode already where I got to show off all my statues and stuff. Um, I was already interested in Isis because I just um, was kind of looking for a certain goddess or, you know, like um, mostly the goddess of love and beauty, which was Aphrodite. Um, Isis is more like a mother. She's like the childbirth. And then I did show my, my statue to Hathor, who is the goddess of Egyptian goddess of love who, um, and Matt knows this, uh, the movie, uh, gods of Egypt came out and I fell in love with Hathor, even though she kind of like gives herself up to set, um, so that he won't kill Horus. I'm sorry, he won't delete Horace. This is going on YouTube, so you have to watch what you say. Um, so in the movie, I I just fell in love with Hathor, who is the Egyptian goddess of love. And on Amazon, I just purchased, uh, just out of the blue, purchased a uh, Hathor statue. And um, she's always kind of been with me, even though I was almost more focused on like, Isis and, and Aphrodite at the time. And then when I joined your course, uh, where to start your wish witchcraft practice, um, that's when I met Hecate. And then, you know, of course I got the, the jewelry to, you know, <laughs> I don't know if anyone can see that. Um, I got her key, um, cause she's been really helping me with me and my soulmate and, um, other spiritual things I've been trying to do. Um, and even in the course of things, my, you know, because we celebrate Isis around, uh, Ostara. So around Ostara, we'll, we'll call to Isis and Osiris. And I actually did buy an Osiris, uh, statue. You saw that, <laughs> um, Matt, that, um, because I mean, they were kind of like a package deal anyway. And I sort of knew the, the background with Isis, but, it was more like when I took your course, it was like a whole big background. And I was just like, yeah, I sort of uh, heard about the the uh, fun part of Osiris. And that's how she got pregnant with with Horus. Because <laughs> she found the, like when Set cut him up in pieces um, and hid the body parts. And then she kind of has to go find them and then kind of, you know, but she takes his fun part <laughs> and, and gets pregnant with it. And, and um, that's how they have Horus. So, um, I'm sorry, my nose is itchy. Someone must be thinking about me. Um, so I also have kind of pulled in, um, not only Osiris, Isis again, and Hathor, uh, but also Kali Ma. And I've, and this is so strange. I, I have watched Indiana Jones and the Temple of Dune since I was very, very small. And I would always turn my, you know, head when the, do -do 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 he's holding the, you know, piece of that guy. Uh, you, Pratt, Matt, you've seen it, I think, right? You've seen that movie? Yeah. Have you ever seen the uh, Indiana Jones and Temple of Dune, Sandra? 
I have a long time ago, so I don't remember yeah. the details. <laughs> so, well, she, um, they, they make Kalima, of course, the, the mean goddess, even it's though she was her. never, yeah, she was <laughs> never mean. I never saw her as mean. I always thought, like, I always felt warmth come from her, like, um, that she was very misunderstood. And when I call to her now, it's just like, she just kind of like watches. She's like peering around the corner. Like if you could see someone like peering around the corner to see what we're kind of doing or what I'm kind of doing. Um, but she has helped me with um, many things. So um, let's get, uh, we're just going to turn the dial a little bit because uh, we do have about 15 more minutes, a little less than 15 minutes. Um, so turning the, the dial a little bit, um, how would you say, like, ha first of all, have you had any uh, paranormal experiences such as ghosts, uh, I don't know, malevolent spirits? Um, they we're kind of doing what we did with Sandra where she, she actually, and, and I couldn't believe that I, sh I, was, I shouldn't have asked her. <laughs> I said, have you ever encountered a, a malevolent, malevolent spirit? Excuse me, I can't talk today. And she actually was kind of reluctant, but she was like, yeah, I have. But she told us the story and I just, I felt like she was like shuddering when she was talking about it. But if you could just tell us if you've had any paranormal experiences uh, with regular spirits or with malevolent spirits, um, how did you deal with it? Or how did you, uh, like, how did it affect your psyche at all? Probably the most. I don't. I don't have that many experiences with malevolent spirits. Fortunately, um, in dreams, I'll usually uh, the last one that I had in a dream, I actually invoked Hecate, and uh, it went away. But ones that I've seen, uh, again, this would have been in the as I was waking up. My uh, deceased partner, he. He was asleep and I woke up and I saw three shadow men. One was behind me, one was over on the other side of the bed and the other one had its hands um, around his neck. So it looked like it was he, they were um, trying to strangle him. Mm -hmm. And uh, my instinct was to pull them off. <laughs> it was just to pull them off. And um, mm -hmm. there wasn't any reaction other than, to pull them off and then I, I sort of woke up out of it and it was interesting because within about a month he actually ended up in hospital because of his lung condition. Mm -hmm. So I don't know where they came from or like whether he picked them up somewhere or whether somebody sent them, um, but they were definitely picking on him. Mm -hmm. uh, but for me usually in a dream or if I'm if I do feel the presence of something like that I will usually invoke Hecate uh, or invoke the Gorgon uh, as protection and I get very um, very stern <laughs> and uh, assertive with them you know it's like you're you just need to show that you won't take any crap from from them <laughs> and uh Sometimes I might banish them in a dream if they're in a dream with a pentagram, banishing pentagram. Uh, if I feel that there is anything in a space or anything that I'm in, I will draw a pentagram um, in the air, usually with my eyes. If I don't want to draw attention to myself, <laughs> I'll, I'll do it with my eyes and project the energy out that way. And, uh, yeah, invoke Hecate if I feel the need to or the Gorgon if I feel the need for it. I haven't it's funny because when I'm when I'm feeling threatened by something, I tend to switch into a very Aries kind of energy because I have that in my seventh house. And um I tend to get very defensive and am ready by ready for combat kind of thing. It's it's like there's a switch that goes off and the shields the shields go up and you know, um it's uh it's like um yeah i'm ready to 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 overpower it or, or or sort of dominate it i guess it's kind of an interesting thing in my astrology with saturn and aries 
And I have, I'm a bit like a boulder with that satin sitting there. <laughs> I'm exactly the same way. And I won't even be thinking about like the Christian exorcist or like the movie or anything. But I literally, every time I've had someone try to come into my space that I feel threatened, I literally want to do an exorcism with them, but in a different way. Like um, mm -hmm. I always invoke like the God and goddess be with me, blessed be, you know, it's never the Christian side of a exorcism, but it's like mm -hmm. that in my dream. And I just feel like I'm always at battle with these entities or if I don't feel safe around someone. Uh, in fact, I tried to do one to my cousin who somehow got into my dream and um <sighs> Which, when I dream about my soulmate, unfortunately, he will touch me and it's like, I don't trust him. You know, I don't trust it because I'm afraid that it's not him. Um, so, in these dreams, I literally will be like, I invoke the goddess, please be with me, blessed be. Blessed be. And then it's like, you know, uh, like I throw white light out of my hands or something like i'll just go like this and um i think at one time i did do a circle i was in the circle and i told everyone else to stay in the circle that was in my dream and then um uh a couple times i've dreamt about snakes um not biting me but like i woke up just before it was about to come and i'm like help me and my soulmate's like you can handle this and I just kind of batted it away. It was like um, how I'm going to deal with uh, I, for, the way I interpret it is the snake was my cousin. And when I just batted away, I was telling him to get out, you know, get out. Mm. I don't need your gruff. I don't need your drama. And, you know, he was coming back around and I woke up just before he was like in my face. So um, I think there's a big battle coming with my with my cousin and I don't think it's spiritual. I think it's physical. Um, but that remains to be seen, but, um, mostly, and this is crazy and it's probably because I'm probably thinking about it, but like recently, uh, in the Midwest and what we call now, I know there can be tornadoes in, uh, Australia. They're, they're all over the place on every continent except for Antarctica. Um, but we just had a major outbreak of tornadoes and tornado alley here in the United States. And that seems the bulk of my dreams. For some reason, I will dream about tornadoes. Um, in fact, recently I dreamt that I was in one, but it did not hurt me. It didn't affect me. And I did not get tossed around because I was kind of like in the movie twister when they tie themselves to that pole and their legs go up and they're, you know, uh, you know, and they get to see the inside of a twister, um, which would never work in reality because, again, you would probably be hit by debris and, pfft, you know, stuff would happen to you anyway. You'd be deleted. Um, but have you ever... Uh, tornadoes in in life are destructive, so in dreams, they mean destruction anyway. Um mm. I've also, when I was younger, I dreamt of reincarnation, which is weird because I never even heard of it at the time. I was about nine, eight or nine, and I would dream that someone would delete me. I would go up to wherever I needed to be, and then I would be reborn. And this kept happening several times in my dream, and I'm just like, why am I dreaming about this? It doesn't make any sense. Um so, I mean, have you ever had any dreams that you've noticed have come true, uh, maybe half come true, all come true, um, which I've had both, actually? <laughs> I've never really had any dreams that I would say were absolutely um, precognitive. It's uh, my dreams tend to be telling me more about things that I'm experiencing um, on a psychological level. My sisters had precognitive dreams, but I don't. I haven't had any precognitive dreams um, that I can recall, which is interesting. It doesn't seem to be where things come to me. It's not through my dreams. Um, connecting maybe with entities, and that comes through dream. 
mm-hmm. because that's really the only way they can connect with me, I think. <laughs> um, because I do, I tend to create like a barrier, I guess. Um, I switch off to it when I'm awake, but when I'm asleep, I'm more open to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, as far as feeling things are going to happen, that tends to be more when I'm awake rather than when I'm asleep. Mm. Okay. Mm. Have you um, ever had feelings of deja vu? Like, you know, oh, I've yeah. done this already. Oh, yeah. I mean, even when I was a child, I would have feelings of deja vu. Like, I've, I've mm. been here. I've done this already. So mm. um, can you explain, like, um, did you? how did you feel? How did it make you feel? Did it get, make the hairs on the back of your neck stand up? Or is it kind of just like, oh, well, it's just, you know, whatever. I sort of think, well, now I sort of look at it as like a glitch in the matrix. <laughs> it's, oh, um, I don't know, tell, you know how being many times the, I've heard that. <laughs> yeah, that, that's some sort of timeline glitch. Um, I know that I did read where the, the I guess the scientific excuse for it is to do with the time tagging, the brain trying to time tag and it, it messes up, gets it wrong. Interesting. Uh, but I sort of see it as being... Either it's something maybe I did dream or it's something that has happened, but it's happened. I'm sort of maybe I'm jumping timelines or I'm in two timelines at once. Uh, That's how I sort of see it. It's an interesting feeling. And I do know that some epileptics experience it before they have a seizure. Um, I've never heard of that. Yeah, I'd heard of that. And... So there's something something interesting. I've always found it interesting. I always, when I was a kid and I used to have them, I used to think they were quite fun. And that maybe it was a past life or I've done it before or I dreamt it before. I was always trying to figure out um, what it might mean. But um, it doesn't give me the creeps or anything like that. It's just a, a curiosity. Mm. Yeah, I'm kind of the same way. I'm just kind of like, well, how did I know how does why does this feel like i it it feels familiar like you've mm. you know you've done it already so why are you still doing it you know that kind of thing um and i think it's mostly because it probably i dreamt about it but i just don't remember dreaming about it even though everybody dreams i know that um have you ever astro projected or maybe lucid dreamed and do you remember exactly um, how you did it, or like, can you do it all the time? Um, I would say, yeah. go ahead. So lucid dreaming, lucid dreaming is fun. I got very excited <laughs> when I first had my first lucid dream. <laughs> it was exciting. I was having a dream, actually. It was a, a shadow character, and they were, he was about to bludgeon me <laughs> oh, <laughs> with no. a big club or something. And I became lucid in the dream. I realised I was dreaming. And Mm -hmm. often, even as a child, whenever I'd have dreams where I was being chased and the perpetrator was close to getting me, I'd, when I was a child, I used to, the dream would say, oh, no, this is just a movie. It's just a movie. It's not real. It's a movie. And that's how it worked when I was a child. But when I started practising lucid dreaming, whenever that would happen, it would kick me into a lucid dream and I would actually be aware that I was dreaming in the dream. And when it first happened, I got excited. I thought, oh, hang on, I'm dreaming. This is really exciting. And I took notice of the, the shadow character and he was sort of stuck very much like in computer animation, maybe sort of more the older animation, whereas if you stopped um, playing the game, and there was like a monster there trying to kill you, it would just sort of just move a little bit like this. It would be in this sort of like waiting mode because, it, mm-hmm. you know, it's waiting for you to re- resume the game. It was exactly like that. He was there with his club and he was going like that, just like in a computer game. Like he, he didn't know, he was not, he had no instructions because I'd mm-hmm. woken up. So he had no role to play because it was, he was, coming from my imagination, I guess. And so I ran up and I hugged him and I was dancing with him, Um, but he wasn't moving. He was just like this all the time as I was hugging him and dancing with him (laughs) because I was so excited that I was having a lucid dream. So it was the first one that I had. Mm. And they're fun. I 
when I want to have them, sometimes I won't have them immediately. I have to spend a few nights because I don't do it that regularly where I will imagine myself, tell myself I'm going to have a lucid dream, I'd like to have a lucid dream and keep focused on doing that and then it will happen uh, in in a dream. I'll just suddenly realise I'm dreaming. And sometimes I've tried to then control the dream after that and have managed to be able to do that for a little while and then I've gone back into to sleep again. But they are fun. You've got to try it. I, I did it do I, I and this is crazy funny, but when I lived in my old house, I actually followed it's like a two hour thing where it just it's like a guided meditation and you would have to like raise your arm up and if you were still like awake, you'd raise your arm up and you know when you fell asleep, this person would talk to you and tell you you're lucid dreaming and I did lucid dream that that time because I just remember I was like, well, I'm dreaming so, Let's have at it. Let's just have the dream. But I don't remember the dream ex specifically. I just know that I was just like, oh, well, let's party, you know. <laughs> um, now, I want to move to astral projection because uh, this is something I'm very interested in doing, at least doing it like uh, my ex, uh, one of the gentlemen I dated back when I was like 14 years old. Um, he can do it at will. In fact, I asked him one time to astral project and come to me. And he did it just like that um is there a way that we could all do that i mean we obviously do it every night when we dream uh we our, our, obviously our astral bodies leave our bodies and technically we're dreaming but we're still having an astral experience i do know sometimes uh my soulmate uh he'll say well you're struggling you know like i'm I, i'm I'm just about to come out, but sometimes like, I'm just like, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. And he's like, let go. I'm like, oh, okay, I'm out. <laughs> um, is, is there a way, Sandra, that you could maybe suggest uh, that it's just automatic that you come out um, kind of like my ex could do at will? Um, is some it people more like are naturally, yeah, some people are naturally more prone to being able to travel that way it, it's just you know some people are more psychic naturally they don't have to try they don't have to develop the skill uh it's just a talent that that they have so it it takes a lot of work to learn to astral travel if you don't have that talent <laughs> it's, it's, could you uh, just it, kind of say you know i would like to astral project tonight uh please help me come out or is it just I would just like to ask yeah you can do that before you so your focus before you'd go to sleep would be on maybe having I mean at first you really shouldn't be traveling outside your space your your own like home space where you feel safe so you'd be focusing on imagining and you do this every night before you go to sleep that you are rising up out of your body you turn around you see your body and then you maybe go for a walk along the same trajectory every night in your imagination. So at first you start, you do it with your imagination, you imagine your astral traveling. And then you start to maybe get a look at yourself, walk into your lounge room or, or somewhere, and then take notice of the things that you see around you, and then come back again and do that every night before you go to bed. It's it's kind of training. It's training your subconscious to do it, and it, it can take months and months and months and months <laughs> for it to happen if you're not naturally talented right. in that area. I mean, I do yeah. come out sometimes. It's just sometimes I struggle. Um, yeah. I when I first did it, um, I would go up through the ceiling. Or I would go down through the floor. Now it's kind of like you just you jump through the floor and pff, I'm wherever I want to be. Um, in fact, I remember one of them was uh, I astral projected with my soulmate, and we went to Russia, and then we also took a vacation to Britain or UK, um, in, in England, uh, London, England, I think. And we saw some like rooftops and stuff, so it was very scenic. Um, when I have these kind of out of body experiences, it's very scenic. <laughs> and he, I guess he likes to take me places. So um, even if I can't get there, you know, by 
poker crook, so to speak. Um, he just kind of likes to take me on little vacations that I can't go on because I'm too poor to get on a plane. And at this point, I wouldn't want to get on a plane anyway. So, um, well, uh, this would conclude our interview. So I would like to thank you, Sandra, for uh, coming on. Um, I do know you would like to stick around a little bit. Um, this probably won't take very long. <laughs> Um, I was just going to do the, the Beltane words and then uh, Matt has a poem he'd like to do. And then I was just going to do the offering uh, endings um, and then uh, we could just, you know, kind of end it. Um, well, we'll end it with, you know, you can find me, uh, Sandra here. And, and again, all her links will be down in the district. Uh, uh, sorry, I can't talk today either. Description field. <laughs> Um, I, and if you could definitely send me that course, I would love to take a look at it and see if it's something that, um, I could definitely do, uh, on my own, but I'm going to go ahead. Um, so we will just say that we have lit a circle or done a circle. Uh, Matt, are you ready as well? Okay, good. <laughs> just give a thumbs up at that point. All right. Um, so we'll pretend we light candles. I can't light any candles, unfortunately, right now if I don't have my fan on and my fan's really loud. So <laughs> I won't be like, uh, because I guarantee you that if I light a candle now, my, my smoke alarm's going to go beep, beep, beep. Oh, gosh. And everybody wakes up. <laughs> so I actually have to have like a fan on and pour it in towards the, can the candle. It doesn't blow it out. It just kind of just moves the, the flame like this. <laughs> But it's it works. So okay. So on this Beltane day, when the veil between the worlds is thin, I call upon the goddess Denu, the great mother of the gods. I call upon the god Belnos, the shining god of the Celts. Be here with me during this ritual. Be here as I celebrate love, fertility, and growth in the season of Beltane. Now it says, stand with your palms. <laughs> Obviously, none of us can stand, but if you just want to put your, just do, do your best, I guess. <laughs> um, this is the time when nature is in heat, when the sun's power is warm and strong. The earth celebrates the joy of creation as I celebrate this fertile time. The earth is rich and the seeds are planted. The wheel of life turns and turns again. Out of the seed springs new life. The wheel ever turning says, raise your arms up. I call upon the goddess Denu. I call upon the mother of the gods of the Celts. I call upon the flowing one. I call upon the goddess of bounty, Donna. Den, oh, sorry. Denadin. I'm sorry if I screw this up. Uh, Denavus, Anu. Hear my call. Stand by my side. Grant me wisdom, health, and prosperity. Show me how to bring my desires into manifestation, to keep them bright and glowing with passion. Show me how to nature or nurture the seeds of my creations, to grow them in their potential. Show me how to transform my life, to grow in wisdom, truth, and purpose. The man manual of Daniel about me. It says, cross your arms over your chest. The memory of Daniel within me it says, uncross your arms and lock your fingers. The protection of Daniel keeping me from harm, from ignorance, from heartlessness. This day and night, from dusk till dawn, from dawn till dusk. I call upon the god Belnos, the bright and brilliant god of the Celts. I call upon the god of the Belfire. I call upon the God of pastures. I call upon the God of purification. Bel, Bellus, Belnos, Bile. Hear my call. Stand by my side. Grant me healing, restoration, and passion. Bring healing to my body, mind, and spirit. Shine your bright, shine your blessings upon me. Show me how to create with the fire of passion so that I can inflame the world with my light. Show me how to make fertile the seeds of my creations. Kindle the fire of growth within me. The mantle of Belnos about me. Cross your finger or cross your arms. 
the memory of Belnos within me. Lock your fingers, the protection of Belnos keeping me from harm, from ignorance, from heartlessness, this day and night, from dusk till dawn, from dawn till dusk. Okay, Matt, you can go ahead and do your poem and then we'll kind of wrap everything up. <laughs> Um, I thought this was appropriate. It actually, um, J.R.R. Tolkien met his wife, um, and she danced in the Hemlock Grove for him, so I thought it would be a kind of beautiful representation of Belting. So, Raven locks as singing flocks brighter than the sun. That day new in golden hue, Edith was the one. Hemlock born, Odin sworn, pulled off Sigurdian task. Tenuviel placed under spell, his hand one ring would clasp. Dancing neath hemlock grove, old tales which newly wove to be alive in the hearts of Hall. And that's it, I just did a short one. That was great, thank you so mm -hmm. much. Um, of course now, if for those who uh, have never taken uh, the course from uh, the great Sandra, <laughs> uh, right now would be, you would do either your meditations or you would do your magic and ask Belnos and Denu to, uh, bless your magic. Um, but we are going to pretend we already did that because <laughs> we don't have time to do a ritual right now. Um, or magic, I should say. So I'm just going to go ahead and close it. Goddess Denu, I thank you for your presence and your blessings. I give offerings to you in praise and gratitude. May you both be pleased and fulfilled. I give offerings and thanks to Belnos of the long arm for your presence here. May you both be pleased and fulfilled. I give thanks and offerings to all the spirits who are local and my ancestors to where I am performing my rites. May you all be pleased and fulfilled. Blessed be. Blessed be. Now I know Sandra, you are actually doing Sawin, is that correct? In Australia. So they yeah. are the southern hemisphere is different from the north. So the north is doing Beltane and the south is doing or sorry, different. The north is doing Beltane and the south is doing uh Sawin. So um Sawin is honestly my favorite time of the year um not in the so southern hemisphere but <laughs> in the northern one because um my son he was born like four days before <laughs> I kid you not he just he didn't want to wait anymore uh so he's my Sawin baby um but I I love Sawin because I love to dress up and I love to take him out and you know he wants to be a firefighter uh, every every Samhain. Um so I think and and honestly Sandra I've gotten him sort of into the whole uh he has his own wand he loves to help mommy with his uh you know with her rituals and stuff so we'll do like a little blessing before we go uh trick or treating for Samhain and then you know we just kind of you know do our thing as they say <laughs> Uh, Matt also has a son. He's a little older than my son. Uh, Matt, do you also like Sawin? Do you go trick or treating with your son? Of course. Uh, we usually just uh, stay at home, actually. But oh, <laughs> but it's fun. Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, a lot yeah. of people. I mean, especially if you have religious people around you or Christians, um, especially a major majority of them. Like I do, some people, they don't even bother turning their lights on <laughs> and, and some do, and then they don't come to the door. So, um, it's extravagant, but, um, Sandra, uh, tell people where we can find you again. All of her links will be down in the description field. Um, jump on the chance to get, uh, that half off for her tarot course. Trust me guys. When I say the tarot course is worth it every bit of it. So every dime you spend, I guarantee you, uh, when you become the confident tarot reader that you will become, it's worth your while. I mean, I literally didn't understand half of the tarot and I'm just like, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I'll just, I'll guess. Um, but I mean, Sandra actually really takes her time and she has all kinds of videos and stuff. I know because I've taken the course myself. So I highly, highly, highly recommend it. And if you can get that half off, unfortunately, I paid full price for it. But hey, it was worth it. Okay. <laughs> it was worth every dime. 
Um, so Sandra, tell us where we can find you. Um, I will put her links in the description. Um, anything new that's coming out? Uh, so tell us where we can find you and anything else that's coming out for you. Okay, well, you can find me on YouTube at Mystery Witch School. And my website is mysterywitchschool.com. So they're probably the easiest places to go. <laughs> and I am working on a course in magic. I'm actually working on two. There's a mini course that's going to specialize in the types of magic, like love magic, prosperity, uh, protection, healing, success, which is like a small course. And then I'm actually working on a much larger course that where you're actually looking at different types of magic. So candle magic, uh, sigil magic, planetary magic, tarot magic. It's basically doing magic with, with different mediums. And so that's mm -hmm. going to be a much larger course. So that's coming up. I'm hoping to release uh, release them at the end of May, at least start mm -hmm. releasing them at the end of May. And um, But we'll see how we go. It's, um, sometimes I think I, I take on more than I, I can chew. <laughs> and when I'm doing a course, I'll go, oh, yeah, this will only take this long. But every time I'm in a module, I think, oh, yeah, but I need to include this. And, oh, I better say that. Right. Oh, I've, I've got to let them know that. And I've got to, oh, I better do this. <laughs> and so it ends up um, becoming uh, bigger than I thought it was. So that magic is the theme for this year. So if you're interested in magic, there's um, some courses that are coming out. Is that where mm. you're going to walk them through how to do the magic itself? Um, or maybe just, you know, get things together and then you do kind of like a walkthrough. So kind of explain, like, uh, how, is, how is that going to come together? How, how are you going to do your modules? So the magic course, which is the magic mastery course, is going to have, each module is going to have a particular theme. So I'm going to cater for people who haven't never done magic before, because I know there will be people who've never done magic before. So I'll go right back to the basics. The first module is really focusing on intention and how to really focus on what your intention is and making like spell jars and wishing pots. Then we'd move Ooh, on to I would candle, like to do and, that. Candle magic. Yeah. So candle magic. Jars. And then there's sigil magic. So I'm going through the different types of, of magic and the techniques of those particular individual magics showing you how to do it like doing a demonstration of creating a spell jar for example doing a demonstration of candle magic uh, as well as giving you all the information that you need and also providing you with spell chants that you can use when you are doing your magic so that if you're not somebody who who's good at making words up then you've got something <laughs> that you can work with <laughs> for all of the different types of things you'd want to do magic for. So love and relationships, protection, uh, success and all its various different forms, uh, prosperity, <laughs> finance, um, wellness and, and health, that kind of thing. But the focus will be on the actual types of magic themselves in that bigger course. The smaller course, which is actually going to be a bonus of the bigger one, uh, is going to have a, a heap of spells themselves. So it's really just teaching those people who aren't interested in learning different types of magic. They just want to do a spell. They just want the spell, tell me what to do because I want to, you know, find the love of my life. And so that's catered more for having lots of different spells that they can use and just guidance on what's what do you need to think about when you're doing a love spell as opposed to doing a prosperity spell what's different about them what do you need to consider uh when you're doing a love spell what do you need to consider when you're doing a prosperity spell to ensure that you'll have the success that you want could you do yeah. a spell to bring the fae into your house like to welcome them in so to speak you you could do it i would be very wary of inviting them into the house <laughs> some of them are <laughs> <laughs> well, I saw them in dream, so they're welcome in my dream anytime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, be and very careful. Very malicious. They weren't uh, mischievous at all. They were just kind of like, oh, I'll let you touch me. You know, they, I think they were more curious about me. But um, how about like, uh, could you do a spell for like uh, astral projection or is that more just, you know, you kind of have to do it on your own? 
uh, intention wise? Yeah, magic's got its place, but okay. there's some things that magic's really not that great at. <laughs> um, it's more you 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 you're better off practicing it and doing it the the magic could help lead you to maybe more help with it so if you did a spell to astral travel you might the magic might uh encourage you it might might help you astral travel or it might bring you to a really good um someone who can teach you to astral travel or a good book on astral traveling or video on astral traveling it could open you up to ways that you could learn to astral travel. I find that if I usually just ask uh, Hecate how to sort of point me in the right direction, she just does. Like, yeah, she, yeah. she got me to you and she she got me to several other things that I've been working on. Um, I mean, it, without her, this show would not exist. My other shows would not exist. Um, I did start working more on my wrestling podcast and then that went to another one and then i i found matt quite by accident on x and i was just like well you're pagan i'm wiccan let's do this let's just make a show about something about wiccan and pagan and and, and as i've had to tell people this show magic is neither black nor white it is just all encompassing and honestly Ooh. we only call it black magic talk just for a catchy tune you know um, on Rumble, I will have specifically, um, I took uh, Black Magic Woman, which I love that song. <laughs> so I'll take like little snippets of songs and put pictures of witches and uh, kind of like a witchcraft scene. And I'll put that on Rumble because unfortunately we'll get copyrights for YouTube. But um, mm. I do have a spiffy, uh, you know, theme song that I'm, I've come out with and it's to Black Magic Woman. The other two are to Witchy Woman and devil woman it just it just all seemed to kind of fit in and you know i was just like well i'm gonna go with this but like the wrestling one has really taken off because i just got over 40k subscriptions so on youtube and i put on x on the wrestling x that um i'm gonna do something so you can vote matt i just want to let you know you can vote since you have x um the poll is up for three days you can either see me in a black hat with a a witch costume you can see me in a mr perfect shirt now i'm wearing a blessed bee shirt right now <laughs> um i actually found this i think on amazon um or you can hear me sing rap is crap on rumble because again it's copyrighted so it, it, it will be a rumble exclusive so um but sandra without you and hecate i don't know if i would be here right now <laughs> i don't think you know, i don't i wouldn't have never met have met matt and I never would have even thought of doing, I do three shows now. <laughs> I do uh, my Kurt Hennig podcast. I do pro wrestling talk, which is every Saturday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, unless we give a different time. And then, of course, we record this one. It's not live. Uh, pro wrestling talk is live. And it's kind of funny how I found I found Angel on X2. And he was sort of like, you know, they had known uh, Kit Cabello, a gentleman that I subscribed to. And Kit's. Uh, I think uh, Matt Kit's going to be on my show because uh, the they're doing a dark side of the ring called the Sandman and he's ECW. So, of course, you want Kit Cabello on there. He's, he knows everything about ECW and that kind of stuff. So um, I'm going to try to have him back on my show. Matt, you're welcome to come back Sunday. Um, it's going to be Sunday about 3 or 4 p.m. He said he was going to get back to me. I don't know. Do you know anything about ECW? <laughs> I know no. nothing. So this is going to be like, uh, I'm going to watch the dark side of the ring. Cause I just watched the one with Sherry. Um, I love the one with Sherry, by the way, cause I love to hate Sherry, but I looked up to her. Um, and I, I don't, I don't know anything about the Sandman except that he go, used to go like this with the beer cans and open himself up with the beer cans. <laughs> Uh, extreme championship wrestling was not my forte. I was like, uh, okay, I'm switching back to WWF. <laughs> um, but you're more than welcome, uh, to come on, uh, Matt, if you'd like to, um, just let me know if you can do it Sunday, like three, 4 PM Eastern standard time. Uh, whenever Kit gets back to me about that, I'll, I'll let you know. Sure. Um, uh, Sandra, again, I'd like to thank you so much for coming on. This was so wonderful. I, I, we have to do this again. Because there's yes. so much more information I want to get out. Um, and unfortunately, we don't, we try to keep these uh, episodes to like a minimum of like an hour if we can. 
Um, mm -hmm. Mostly because I have other stuff I have to do after this. I have to, you know, uh, edit everything and I have to put my theme song on. And unfortunately, I can only do that on my phone. I can't find a, an app to do that. And I'm not paying for an app anyway. So, um, but I, I thank you so much for doing this. I know the time zone. Thanks for having me. Yeah, the time is kind of, it's like, what, 12 o'clock there? Uh, yeah, it probably is. Yeah, I can't have my glasses on, so I can't see anything. <laughs> it's 12.30, yeah. 12.30, so it's like 10 p.m. here, and I think it's, uh, hang on, it's 7, almost 7.30 where you are, Matt, because you're in California. Um, so I'd like to thank everybody for showing up today. Again, every, all the links will be in the description field. I just want to let you guys know, we also have a Patreon for black magic talk. If you'd like to give to the show, it's one, $5 or $1, $3, $5 and $10. Um, you can pick whichever tier is to your fancy, whatever you can afford. If you can, uh, please, please, please give, uh, to our Patreon show. Uh, we're splitting it 50-50. Matt gets 50% of what I do, and I get the other 50%. Uh, fair is fair. Right, Matt? <laughs> we're going to be fair about this. So if you can please give, again, all description, uh, all links will be in the description field. I will have everything uh, that Sandra has, um, like I've been doing in every kind of video. I've been giving all kinds of uh, your links, um, Sandra, I've been doing the Mystery Witch School. Uh, also, Matt, I've been doing your teacher as well, and we're going to have your teacher on soon enough. Um, but I'd like to thank our guest again. She's amazing. If you'd like to check her out, again, check out her links. They will be in the description field. And everyone have a great evening and blessed be. Thank you. Blessed be.